By the end of the 1965 war, a host of NAT pilots had become household names. Trevor Keeler, V.S. Patania, Denzel Keeler, Vinay Kapila, Black leader A.J.S. Sandhu and a host of others who had collectively earned for themselves the sobriquet of Sabre Killers. There was this whole group of us from 7 and 27, all the hunter squadrons around, who were uh, told to move on to the new NAT conversion squadron, which had been formed in Ambala. A number 18 squadron, commanded by then Wing Commander Aubrey Michael, was the deputed conversion squadron. So, the war had hardly finished when, in the beginning of October itself, we were all sitting in Ambala. Uh, Darshan Singh Jaffa and KC Khanna were the flight commanders and uh, there we were, uh, all set and ready to fly the NAT. It was a very exciting uh, thing for us because of the reputation that the NAT had acquired during the 1965 war. Pakistan's tryst with its own destiny spilled over into Indian territory as hundreds of thousands of refugees poured across the border. Civil war between East and West Pakistan would eventually see the emergence of a new state, Bangladesh. For the IAF, the war couldn't have begun in a more dramatic fashion when four Indian Nats scrambled to shoot down three Pakistani sabres in broad daylight, a dogfight that was witnessed by hundreds of people from the ground. The sabres are coming into the Boira salient again and again. They're coming in low from Tezgao, rendezvousing over Jesso, forming up into a stream and then pulling up into a northwesterly direction towards the border. At the border, they are doing a 180 degrees turn onto a southerly course, strafing our armor and making a getaway low level towards Jesso. They are repeating this seven to eight times during each sortie. Trouble is, the sabers are over Indian territory for too short a period, the salient being just three kilometers wide. That was 22nd November at 2.45 in the afternoon and that was of course the 71 war I'm talking about when uh, we got a scramble order and Ganpati, Tony, Massey and myself got everyone I think in very quick time uh, being all very young at that time at this time Massey who was my leader saw them and he took a decision to pull over Don and Gana and get behind the first aircraft we got behind the first aircraft at about kilometer and a half, 1500 yards maybe and somebody must have warned him because he went into a very very hard turn. That's when Massey fired the first round or the first burst, it missed. It came slightly closer and then second one, second burst got him in the right wing. And this I remember in slow motion, the wing catching fire, canopy eject being ejected and the pilot started ejecting when we overshot the aircraft. In the meantime, while this was going on, Gana shouted out, I've got one, I've got one. And a few seconds later, Don Lazarus also said, somebody is in front of me, he reversed out and shot that pilot, shot that aircraft. It was all over in about two minutes. Three aircraft, no loss to us, we return back to base. And it all started on the third evening at about 5.45 hours. Those were the winter days and we were just 
back from the squadron, sitting outside in the lawns of the officers' mess, and the six sabers pulled up, and they came and dropped bombs over Kanpur. But none of the bombs hit the military installations, and then it all started. We got this young Sikh gentleman called uh, Sekhon, who had come in, and he was a tall Sadar, and I told him, listen, you are much too tall to fly the net. But he said, no sir, I am bent on flying this and that's what I am going to fly. So it was great watching him, uh, the, the, the spirit was there. So he, I, I remember doing his blindfold checks and he was very keen. I didn't fly with him during the operations when uh, Sekhon was involved in a attack by the sabers who came over the Murray Hills and attacked the airport. That day there was, I, what I've heard is that there was a lot of uh, fog. The visibility was very bad. We had decided that we will not get airborne. We in fact had told the base ops that visibility less than 500 meters, we will not be flying. It just so happened me and uh, Nate Seko, properly known as Brother Seko. We were both uh, brushing our teeth and we heard a word scramble, scramble. And we standing next to each other and I said, Brother, are you with me? He said, Yes, brother. So we scrambled. As I came out of the pen, I saw him coming out of the pen. Same word I used, I said, with me, he said, Yes. As soon as we lifted up, visibility was less than 50, 50 meters. And this Dust stroke haze or a fog was up to 3000 feet. As a procedure, I pulled up and uh, I got a call from uh, brother. Uh, I have fought, uh, sought, sighted two sabers and I won't let them go today. I said, Good show, let me know where are you so that I can come and clear your tail. By the time I turned around and I went above the haze, there were no aircraft visible. And uh, I kept calling him, brother, where are you? Where I did not get any call from him. On the my third chakra, I found a flash of fire near the village Badgaon. It's very close to a field. Apparently, he had got behind, and I heard a burst of his uh, one burst of 30 mm. And then people saw him firing at the second saber also. We used to go about say 50 to 60 kilometers into Pakistan and then we'd keep orbiting at that point till the Sukhois went in and attacked their targets and on the way back we'd make sure that they wouldn't be attacked by the Pakistan aircraft so we used to zoom up to height and try and get the uh, Pakistani aircrafts to engage us but not once did they come in and try and engage. So on the way back we used to attack uh, high tension cables, uh, railway junctions, whatever we could find. I must mention about the HE ammunition, you know. Throughout training we had um, ball ammunition which you fired constantly in, on targets which were made out of canvas. So I remember in one of the sorties we went to fire on a Pakistan, or what they told us was uh, a transport ship transporting troops. So they sent us down the Kulna River and they said if you spot the ship, just fire at it. So we, two of us took off, went down the Kulna River and then we spotted this about a hundred, hundred feet ship. Not too sure whether it was uh, carrying troops or not, but since we had a free hand to do whatever we went, we decided to attack the ship. So I pulled up and went for the ship and I fired my guns. This was, I think, the third day, so I had not really seen how a gun performed, beside, of course, the shooting down of the aircraft. And then, when I put in my burst in the middle of the ship, I got a surprise, because the ship just broke into half. It just split into two, so I pulled up and I said, what had happened, you know? <laughs> and of course, my number two was very upset, because he had no target to hit. After 9th of December, we hardly saw any opposing air activity on that front, mainly because I suppose the Pakistani Air Force was grounded majorly. 
they were also instructed as we came to know later not to engage the indian air forces mix and nats in that war subsequently <laughs> Minister Indira Gandhi announces to the world Dhaka is now the free capital of a free country the instrument of surrender was signed in Dhaka at 1631 hours the only country in the world to fly the nat operationally the aircraft carved its own place in the annals of indian aviation eventually the fighter boys of the indian air force stepped forward to ride the aircraft into battle as it emerged as the hero of the indian skies but for the varied test pilots and technicians of hindustan aeronautics who helped develop the nat project the little g bird has left an imprint on not just theirs but the nation's heart as well today 50 years after the aircraft first flew in india the nat brotherhood gathers to salute the flying machine that played its own role in shaping modern india no other aircraft in indian aviation history has so captured the imagination of those who flew it it was an aircraft you could fly as though it was an extension of your body and you became part and parcel of it which other aircraft have they tried to have reunions over which other aircraft has uh, created images of loyalty to its brotherhood man because it was a pilot's aircraft it was fun to fly if i want to think of anything else which was fun to fly and go back to the tiger moth when i was coming into land with the nose down that is the first time i felt that is not the aircraft flying but i am flying because the visibility was such that i could see the ground and didn't see the wings didn't see anything uh, it was a really remarkable uh, feeling that uh, you know i myself got my own wings and i'm flying without any aeroplane around me before i flew the nat for the first time in 1973 i already had about 1000 hours on the big 21 and i was quite used to very high performance machines even then when i first flew the nat the experience was as breathtaking as i was led to believe by my contemporaries Looking back I think that was a very unique aeroplane. Sitting in the cockpit one had a feeling of wearing an aeroplane around you. What an agile aircraft. Um almost you you could think what you want to do it and like it would do it uh, immediately and you never realized the sensation of G very quietly crept onto you 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 were maneuvering and and you didn't realize the the g forces that were acting on you till you attempted to perhaps move your head a bit and then you found that you couldn't move your head all that easily that's when you realized that you were probably clocking 4 4 g so it's it, it was a beautiful machine quite an extension of oneself i've been nat 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 chap and i've flown the nats and ajit for a very long time 9 years and i got about 750 hours in both these aircraft combined I remember quite clearly that uh, when we when i lined up for take off open throttle the little thing just shot uh, down the runway and before i could uh, say anything i was airborne and uh, next thing i was at 10000 feet and uh, my undercarriage was still down and uh, somebody had to yell from the atc retract your undercarriage every every sortie was a new chapter in your life it was a new challenge and uh, it made a man out of We used to say, you know, it's so simple. You just kick the tire, light the fire, and you scramble. It's literally like that. When I sat over there, everything was so simple. One hit of the elbow, and all your circuit breakers go in. One left to right, hit the relight button for start on the ground. Fingers twirling is the fastest start I've seen on any fighter aircraft. Uh, I remember Pondi Jay Kumar in Ambala uh, came charging out of the bloody ORP. 
panting and uh, excited because there was a scramble ordered. As it is six foot two or so, he decided to pitch himself uh, into the cockpit as fast as he could. Uh, but unfortunately, he was so fast that he pitched himself over the cockpit and uh, got to the other side. As a matter of fact, when we used to scramble off the ORP, of the operational readiness platform, especially Halwara, we used to, you know, time ourselves with stopwatches. Guys have done it under 50 seconds, 55 seconds. In Ambala, uh, we had a, a flight commander called Mazis, A.K. Mazumda, also a Veer Chakra. An amazing man, a, a man who we all loved and respected. And uh, one day, some foreign visitors turned up and uh, the base commander decided to show the capabilities of the NAT and how fast it could get airborne. So he made a demand of Mazisa to say, can you do an under minute scramble? Mazisa gave him that caustic look that he normally gave a chap who was asking for something unreasonable, but decided that the izzat of the Indian Air Force had to be kept. Uh... So at the ORP, all these guys standing by, a scramble was ordered, Mazi ran in, he actually didn't strap up, started up and took off and he did it in under a minute. Uh, crazy things, crazy things that all of us have done in our lives, some or the other, but uh, it was for the Azad of the Air Force.